Hi, welcome to the RoboHub podcast. Would you mind introducing yourself for us, please? Sure. Uh, I'm Bill Smart. I'm a professor in robotics at Oregon State University. And uh, for the past year, I've also been part-time at Amazon as an Amazon scholar. Awesome. So have you always seen yourself working in robotics and CS and STEM or, or sort of what's your story getting to where you are now? Um, so I've always sort of been a science guy, a math guy. I was you know, good at math, uh, mathematics in high school. Uh, kind of fell into computer science from there and then from computer science into robotics. Um, the origin story is, is a, a little weird. I, I first thought about robotics because I saw an article about Rod Brooks and his group in, uh, uh, I think it was Smithsonian Magazine, and it just looked really cool, and that sort of led me to robotics. I feel like a lot of us in robotics get into it just because it, it does look cool. It's visually cool, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and it's something you can build and actually have a, a, an actual thing from the computer science sort of side. Um, which often is just, you know, software. So uh, tell us how have you been involved in competitions? Because uh, we hear that you sort of helped start the ICRA competitions. Yeah. Um, so I think it was 2008 in Pasadena. Um, we had the first ICRA robot competition. That was something Paul Ribsky, who, who was at CMU then, and, and I um, led for a couple of years. Uh, we got a lot of support from ICRA. Um, I think Gaurav Sakami was the general chair that year. He, he gave, gave us a lot of support to get it going. And really it was just a, a, an, an effort to try and get robots at a robotics conference. Uh, ICRA is a great conference and there's a lot of great work there. But the only robots historically were in the, the vendor booths and it, it felt like we should have something that kind of tied the robots to the, the research being presented. Yeah, and so what were the original competition like what were the what were you trying to push what was it doing oh that's that's great so the there's a real tension with competitions where you want to reflect what's going on in research and not make it a sort of special thing that diverts people from research because mm. then people don't really get interested in it um the first year we had well i maybe i should have done my homework the first year <laughs> we had a. Uh, it was like a planetary exploration thing where we built a little Marscape from gravel and stuff in the in the convention center. I think there was a modular robots event. Mark Yim was involved in doing a modular robots event and something else, which I can't I really can't. <laughs> That's fine. But what we did is we put out um, a call for people who were interested in running a competition. So we, we facilitated it and helped with the infrastructure. But we had people uh, propose competitions and run them independently, autonomously. Hmm. That's cool. So I'm trying to reflect what was sort of hot in the research field at the time. Yeah. I feel like competitions are kind of this in-between ground of industry and uh, academia too. And you sort of mentioned that you had, uh, you've worked briefly at Amazon, right? Uh, or you've spent some time there. How do you sort of see that relationship between industry and academia or maybe tied in with competitions? Well, I think in the, the history of the ICRA competitions, it's been mostly academics who've led them but a couple of times um i know amazon led the the picking challenge which was a competition for a few years and uh fetch robotics led the uh i forget what they call it, the fetch manipulation challenge for a couple of years and i think it's a way to you know for companies to engage with the academic community in a a relatively structured way you know maybe they have a problem they want to solve um or a, a problem they want to inspire people to think about um I think you know, it's, it's hard to use the stuff that comes out of competitions directly in industry you know, because of IP problems and because just, you know, things have to be a lot more hardened in industry, yeah. I think. But I think it's a good way to get that first engagement, get people interested in that, you know, in, in a part of the space, maybe. Definitely, because it also is something, you know, sometimes visually and entertaining with like robotic soccer or something like that, if that's sort of the competition. And I can see that being really engaging. Yeah, and I, I think the, the, the ACRA competition, you bring up RoboCup, right? And I think RoboCup's been tremendously successful, but it sort of focused on the competition and the science grew out of the competition. Mm. And I think what we were trying to do at ACRA is kind of maybe the, the other way around where we try to get the science to, to, to use the competition to demonstrate the science as instead of having the, the competition drive the science, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. 
as a way to sh sort of show off the, the the research that's been going on. Yeah, right? yeah, and, and, you know, a tangible way of actually seeing the robots in action, and maybe you know, force us as researchers to be a little more honest about the assumptions we're making when mm -hmm. we, you know, formulate things in our papers. That's another good point. It kind of gives you also a deadline. It, it kind of gives you like something to push towards, something to work towards. Whereas when you're working on research, it can kind of be a little nebulous in how you set your own goals. Yeah, I think I think that's it's a good thing and a bad thing. I think the the deadline is a good thing, but uh, uh, the flip side of that is you have a deadline which is right next to the competition, and you know uh, right next to the conference rather. And when you go to ICRA, you kind of want to go and see the talks because the talks are good. Um, but if you're in the competition, there's sort of a tension there of like, unless you've met the deadline already, no one ever does. Yeah. Like you're kind of hacking away at midnight and, you know, do you do the competition or do you do the, uh, do, do the conference? And I think we've, that's been a challenge over the years because you want it to reflect the research. But if you're reflecting this research, you kind of want to go and present and listen to research talks mm. at the conference. And so yeah. I think that's something we've, we've been working through over the years, trying to trying to find that right balance. Yeah. And so have you seen the competitions kind of evolve over the years and change? Yeah. I mean, certainly the, the material in them, the subject matter is changing. Um, I think it's still, they're still um, not as integrated with the main conference as they might be. And I, I don't really know how to do that. Mm. Um, but I think, I'm really pleased to see that it's still going like this is 2022 and we have competitions this year. Um, and so it's really cool to see what Paul and I pitched out there, you know, <laughs> feels like a thousand years ago um, is, is still going. So there must be some utility in it, I think. Have you seen any sort of real world benefits that come out of it? Any, or do you have any? Um, well, I mean, I think all this, I, I think the engagement with companies, you know, if you're, if you're a company at ICRA, you can come and see someone working with robots and actually see tangibly what they're, they're up to rather than just mm -hmm. listening to them present. Maybe, maybe there's something that's come out of that. It's hard, hard to quantify that maybe. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's got people interested in different parts of the space. And then maybe that has led to some results, but I think the, the competitions themselves, I, I'm not so sure that I've, have had a direct that you can draw a direct line between the competition to something in the in the world yeah it could be hard to sort of make that direct uh link yeah there. but i mean at the same at the same time you can think of you know asking the same question of papers like mm -hmm. if you see a paper right how a lot of the papers you see at ICRA make it into product and make it into systems but the you know the line isn't ob always obvious yeah I, I, one thing is, I know that some of your work you've done, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you've worked on having longer term research with with like an experiment, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So a competition feels very short term. Do you think there could ever be a long term competition? That's a great question. Um, in some sense, RoboCup does this, you know, mm -hmm. because you you release your code and people build on your code. I guess, yeah. Year yeah. on year. Um, but could you have the same thing where you come back every year? Um, that's a really interesting idea. I've never really thought of that. Um, I think logistically it's hard mm -hmm. because you get quite a lot of churn within the student body. That's you know, true. And if, if you've done it this year, and you're writing your dissertation next year, you're you're going to be less inclined to do it. Um, that's a really interesting question, though, because then that would be a great way to demonstrate progress year on year, which is, I think, one of the things we wanted to try and do originally with competitions. Yeah. One thing, it could be hard to get people, or maybe not, but get people involved if you're already doing like a multi-year thing. Because normally yeah. I would think you want everyone like new people every year to be joining right the competition yeah again I, again i think you want both things um you know the new people you know it, it's constant training for new students and it gets more people excited um but you still need that that year to year knowledge transfer if you're going to be building on things um i think the the, the challenge as an academic is funding competitions year on year because you know you have a team of you know five students you have to you know, wherever ICRA is, and ICRA goes around the world, mm -hmm. you have to find funding to get them and the robots to ICRA reliably to, to sustain that. Um, it's a really interesting idea, though. Yeah. And if anyone's listening and wants to pitch it, I would I would love to support that. Yeah. So there we go. If anyone's listening and wants to do it. Um, 
So I, I see competitions often sort of being an interdisciplinary approach with multiple people working on a team to, to do something. And that's also just true of robotics generally. Yeah. Um, one thing I, I was intrigued when I looked into your background was that you have worked with robotics and policy um, and sort of how the two overlap. Maybe could you talk a little about that and, and what your interest there is? Yeah. Um, so we're, we're starting to see robots coming into the real world. Um, you know, you can, you can actually buy robots and have them in your home now. Um, industry is using robots extensively. And one of the things that is uh, causing concern in industry, I think, is litigation over robots, how the law interacts with robots, how they're regulated, um, what will happen when things go wrong, if there's an accident. Um, and there's just a lot of uh, new material in that space, right? We, we haven't litigated a lot of robotics cases. We don't have many uh, legal scholars, legal practitioners, policymakers who know about robots. And we don't have a lot of roboticists who know about the law and know about policy. Um, so about 10 years ago, uh, with a, a co-author, Neil Richards, who's a law professor at WashU in St. Louis, we wrote a paper you know, trying to draw some outlines of how the law should start to think about these new technologies. And so it draws heavily on a lot of scholarship in the legal community already. Um, around the, the the internet and other technologies. A lot of stuff influenced by Ryan Kahlo from University of Washington. Mm. Um, and we, we managed to get that into a conference called We Robot, uh, which is this September in Seattle, if anyone wants to go, uh, which is a great conference that brings together uh, legal scholars, policy scholars, practitioners, and technologists, and talks about real practical problems and real practical solutions at the intersection of all those things. And it just struck me as, A, there aren't enough technologists, no, there aren't enough roboticists engaging with the legal community. And B, I'd really like to learn more about the legal community. And so it's just been a really interesting way for me to learn stuff that I didn't learn about and sort of to expand what I'm thinking about in, in my day-to-day -day job. That's really cool. I feel like often we... It's easy to be like, oh, yeah, the people working on law don't know anything about robotics. And people in robotics kind of assume that, oh, the politicians, they don't sort of know anything about what we actually work on. Um, but I, I don't really know what they're working on or how they I don't really understand the whole process. And so that is cool to learn both sides uh, in, yeah, in and both directions. That first year at the We Robot conference, I was in the back row on Wikipedia looking up all these really simple legal terms mm -hmm. because I, I really didn't understand anything. And, and over the years, I've, 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 got, I've got some understanding of it now. But I think the, the best thing about going to conferences like that is not that I can learn the law, it's that I can learn enough of the grown-up mm -hmm. words to talk to people who know the law. And we can have a real conversation, a meaningful conversation. And maybe I can help get them grounded in you know, what robots are and what they're not and what's science fiction and what's practical. Yeah. Um, and there's a growing community of uh, roboticists uh, who you would recognize from ICRA engaging with uh, communities like this. And I think I, I would encourage anyone listening to get involved in that because it's, it's really interesting. And I think the only way we're going to get good regulation and good policy and good law is by having both of these sides really get into it and have these deeper conversations. Yeah. Do you think a, a competition could ever exist there to help them really get into it? Um, yeah, potentially. I think the you know this year we have a, a competition that's sort of focused on robot ethics, mm. where you know part of it is you propose a design and then there's a, there's going to be a little hackathon at ICRA to try and implement some practical ethics. Um, and mostly to, to understand, not to come come with a, come out with a complete system, but to understand how how hard that is, taking the way that ethicists and lawyers talk about things, and grounding it out in, in working code. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the the problems of engaging the legal community to pick to pick that community with competitions is a, a problem we've had with competitions from the start. In that you're not really rewarded for winning a competition as a faculty member or as a grad student you're rewarded for getting papers or maybe yeah. getting funding or you know, new results and so i think one of the things that's been hard in the legal work is trying to like line up the incentive structures so the papers that i've uh, 
I've published in the legal community are technically unpublished from my my promotion point of view because they're evaluated by undergraduates in law journals. Mm. They're, they're not peer reviewed in the way that we peer review them. Yeah. And so the, the incentives for me are, are like off from the incentives from the legal community. And I think that carries across doubly in these com- competitions. Then. Interesting. But it's obviously something beneficial to do. So it should somehow, you know, you would hope. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I think we've found ways to do it. Um, you know, you, you write a paper maybe with more of a slant towards the technical community and you publish it, uh, maybe not in, in ACRA, but, you know, other, other IEEE conferences like um, Advanced Robotics and S- uh, Social Impact, something like that, mm. or AIES. Uh, and then maybe you write a slightly different paper, but it's more slanted towards the legal community and you publish that in a, a law review or something like that. Mm. But it, it's something I think it's easier... For a roboticist, it's easier later in your career. Maybe when you've, you know, you've, you've got a background of technical publications that your tenure committee is going to be happy with. Mm-hmm. Um, it's easier to do the, yeah, you know, I don't know, the slightly weirder stuff. Yeah, yeah. Once you've got that groundwork, then you can sort of right. do the it. Frequent tenure. Yeah. But I, I, I really encourage anyone to get involved in this. And I think, you know, looking at job opportunities in the future, I think there's going to be a tremendous market for either lawyers who understand technology or technologists who understand legal frameworks. Mm. Do you think that it has to be one person or you worked with a uh, with a law professor, right? To... Yeah, no, I think you have to, it's like everything. Like when you're building a robot, you're not both the mechanical engineer and the computer scientist, mm. but you know enough of the other person's language to, to be able to collaborate with them. I think it's the same thing. Yeah. I don't know the law, but I know enough of the basics of the law and enough of the the terms that I can talk to my colleagues who do know the law and we can have this sort of substantive discussion about it. Yeah. Yeah. Know enough to be able to have that conversation. Yeah. And and to be able to collaborate. And I think too, you know, there's this growing community and with, as communities grow, you, you, you start to trust each other. So now I have people who know the law who I'm not embarrassed to go and ask really dumb questions of. Mm. And they say, well, oh, 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 every first year knows that. And then they explain <laughs> it. And then they ask really dumb technology questions of me. And and I think that getting past that um, embarrassment is a is key for this sort of stuff. Yeah. Do you have any advice for how to build that sort of network? Um, to... Come to We Robot in September at the University of Washington. <laughs> I think it's it's like a lot of things. Um, you know, it's like when you go to ICRA, you listen to papers, but a lot of the, the the business of the conference happens in the hallway, right? When you're meeting people and you're talking about like slightly less fleshed out ideas. I think it's really just building your professional network, um, getting, you know, finding someone who's maybe a little more, a little further down their career path than you are. And then it's a lot, you know, asking to be, brought to the table, you know, and, and, and sort of injecting yourself into those conversations. That's great advice. Yeah. We're getting closer to time here. So uh, I, I'd like to wrap up with what are you most excited about moving forward? If this could be a project you're working on, this could be competition related or just whatever you're most excited about. I'm, I'm just really excited to be in robotics right now. I think we're at this weird place. Um, I've been doing robotics now for about 30 years. <sighs> um, which seems like a long time, but we finally figured out how to build robots that people can buy and put in their homes or put in their businesses that are doing things that are practical. We can start to think about, you know, how does, how do people interact with these robots for more than an hour for you know, for a couple of, for a couple of weeks at a time or years at a time, uh, we start to, I think we start to be able to answer the more interesting questions. Because we not we understand like how to make a robot go from here to here. We know how to build a map. We, you know, these aren't solved problems by any means, but we know enough now to ask questions that are large scale and actually could affect how we live our everyday lives. Yeah, that's kind of a rousing answer. <laughs> that I, I I totally agree though. So we're we're finally seeing these robots come into the real world, and I think that introduces a lot of really cool, interesting new problems. And yeah. Yeah. And I think too, like there's an opportunity now, if you want to get a job in robotics, you can join a company and work on a robot 
that in two or three years' time is going to make someone's life measurably better. Mm. And that is really good. That is really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Wow. Well, thank you for taking the time to come talk with us. And, and uh, I really enjoyed hearing all that you had to say. Um, so thank you. That's my pleasure.